and welcome to this knowledge clip on the International Court of Justice advisory opinion on reservation to the Genocide Convention. What I would like to do in this knowledge clip is twofold. First, I would like to explain to you the context in which the advisory opinion was re requested in order to help you understand why this advisory opinion is significant. Second, I would like to look at the answers that the court provided to the questions posed in the advisory opinion request, and hopefully this will help you understand the court's approach to the issue of reservation. Now, why is this advisory opinion significant? When the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties already provides for reservation, well, it is worth bearing in mind that the legal regime on reservation did not always look like what it is today under the Vienna Convention. In fact, before the advisory opinion was rendered, the general rule for reservation is that a state cannot make a reservation unless all parties to the convention accept the reservation. In other words, a reservation would only have effect if there is unanimous agreement amongst all parties to the convention to accept the reservation. Now, of course, this requirement of unanimous agreement was to uh, ensure the integrity of the convention and to prevent the convention from being fragmented or uh, preventing the convention from being applied in different ways to different parties. But for multilateral conventions, this posed a problem. Um, unanimous agreement is not always easy to secure, and therefore states are put off from participating in conventions for fear of being bound by a treaty which would require them to make changes to their domestic law that they do not wish to. For the Genocide Convention, which is a multilateral convention, and a human rights convention, a further problem arose. This is um, the problem was that for human rights conventions, the uh, participation of a large number of states were crucial to ensure the effective implementation of human rights protection. In relation to reservation, this raised the question how to balance between, on the one hand, the need to secure widespread participation in the convention, and on the other hand, the need to ensure the convention's integrity. It is this concern that prompted the United Nations General Assembly to submit a request for advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice in 1950. Essentially, the advisory opinion revolved around the following scenario. A state party to the Genocide Convention, State A, makes a reservation to the convention. This reservation, however, meets the objection of another state party, State B, but not of State C, which is another state uh, party to the convention, so State C accepts the reservation. In this scenario, the questions posed to the court were, uh, first, what is the status of the reserving state, state A? In other words, is state A considered to be a party the, to the convention while maintaining the reservation, but this reservation is then objected by some states to the uh, convention, but not by others? Uh, the second question then follows from question one, in that if the uh, court finds that state A is still deemed a party to the convention, what is the effect of the reservation on the relationship between state A, the reserving state, and state B, the state that objects the reservation? And what is the effect of the reservation on the relationship between state A, the reserving state, and state C, the state that accepts the reservation? The third question revolves around the status of the objecting state, but the, for the purposes of this knowledge clip, we will only look at the answers of the court to questions one and two. Now, in response to question one, the court first recalled the fundamental principle of state consent by which a state cannot be bound without its consent, and therefore, no reservation can be affected against the state without it accepting the reservation. At the same time, the court also recalled the principle of treaty integrity, which means that no reservation can have effect 
unless all parties accept it without exception. However, in the case of the Genocide Convention, the court held that the principle of treaty integrity had to be applied with some level of flexibility. And this level of flexibility was warranted on account of the fact that the Genocide Convention was a convention of a universal character. And Article 11 of the Genocide Convention envisions a, wide, a high degree of participation of all states. The court also observed that in state practice, states had been making reservations to multilateral conventions. And so therefore, the fact that a convention does not contain a provision on reservation does not mean that the reservation is prohibited. It merely means that states did not want to invite a large number of reservations. Based on this, the court made a very important observation, a statement which deserves to be quoted in full. The character of a multilateral convention, its purpose, provisions, and mode of preparation and adoption are factors which must be considered in determining in the absence of any express provision on the subject, the possibility of making reservations as well as their validity and effect. So essentially, the court set out the factors to guide the assessment of the validity of um, reservations. Applying these factors then to the Genocide Convention, the court found that the circumstances leading to the adoption of the convention show that the state parties to the convention gave their assent to the possibility of making reservations. But what kind of reservations and what kind of objections would be allowed? The court answered this by looking at the character and the object of the convention. It found that the Genocide Convention was not only universal in character, but it also had a, um, a humanitarian and a civilizing purpose, which is to safeguard the existence of certain human groups and to endorse the most elementary principles of morality. The object and the purpose of the convention then in the court's view imply that the uh, convention wanted to secure um, the participation of as many states as possible. The exclusion of one or more states would restrict the scope of its application. However, due to the significance of its humanitarian object, the court also held that it did not find that the states um, parties to the convention would want to sacrifice the object of the convention just to secure a high level of participation. Therefore, um, the key to assessing the um, validity of reservation as well as the validity of objection to reservation was the compatibility of the reservation with the object and purpose of the convention. And of course, this had to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. With regards to question two, the court held that each state has the right to make its own individual assessment of another state's reservation to a multilateral convention. And the state could do this from its own point of view. So for example, if state A issues a reservation to the convention, state B then, according to its evaluation of the compatibility between state A's reservation and the object and purpose of the convention, decides to object to the reservation um, and object to the party status of state A, then the convention will not enter into force between the two parties, state A and B. State C, on the other hand, based on its own evaluation of the compatibility of state A's reservation with the uh, object and purpose of the convention, decides to also object to the um, state A's reservation but it does not object to the party status of state A. This would mean that the convention enters into force between state A and state C, except for the provisions to which um, the uh, reservation relates. Thank you very much.